Today's programme is about a most unusual public school, supported largely by public funds. St George's School at Great Finborough near Stowmarket was founded in 1978 by one Derek Slade, M.A. This remarkable establishment specialises in educating the children of servicemen and, by all accounts, makes Dickens' Do the Boys Hall look like a holiday camp. St George's, as far as I'm concerned, is an extraordinary school. There were many things that took place that would be regarded as extremely odd at a normal school. The school was run on totally autocratic lines. If a member of staff did not agree with the school's policy, was likely to be asked to leave. It's a nice way of putting being dismissed. The discipline for the pupils was extremely harsh and extremely frequent, even for the younger boys in the school, all boys from the age of as young as six through till the age of 17, were punished by beating with various implements. The headmaster often set an essay with the title of Whackings I Have Had. It's not an essay title I ever set, but uh, I suppose you can draw your own conclusions from it. The beatings were often very harsh and for very insignificant offences. There were also some very odd goings-on of a sexual nature, one of which, or some of which, resulted in one of the masters leaving the country. All in all, it's a school to stay away from. If I had a child, I would not send it to St George's to be educated, and I would advise anybody else to do the same. Former games master Mark Anderson, one of a number of ex-staff who tell the same kind of story, of repression, of brutality and more. However, pupils speaking openly of their experiences are hard to come by. 95% of the 250-odd boarding pupils are the offspring of servicemen. The Ministry of Defence pays the school a minimum of £746 per term each. The Ministry blocked access to their pupils. Parents, too, can be uncooperative. Some seem to agree with the school's ultra-strict regimen, or they're unaware of just how far it goes. Since they're usually on overseas posting, their children are forbidden except in dire emergencies to make phone calls home, and all their letters are read before posting. Even when you trace pupils, as we've done, they're reluctant to go on the record for fear of the consequences. This lad felt that way and only agreed to broadcast if his voice was disguised. It's a bit difficult to know where to begin because basically everyone's under Slady's little rule there. If you don't do what he says, you're not in his good books. You've got to obey him to every order. If you do that, you'll get on fine. And if you don't, you're going to be in trouble from the time you go there to the time you leave. Even silly offences incur serious punishments, such as six of the best, which is often given with your trousers down, and more often than not, boys who have had it come out with blood, not so much dripping from their behinds, but evident. And then there are four different beating implements, the cane, the stick, the jacari bat, and Jasper the gym shoe which he uses according to how serious the fence is in his eyes. Sometimes when two boys have a grudge against each other, they'll both go to him and have what's called an official fight, where he'll officiate and referee as they tear each other to pieces. And it's not really stopped till some damage is done. It's never stopped when they're both OK, just as a token. It always goes on a little bit too far. And... Uh, Sometimes this can involve big boys against small boys. Not very often, admittedly, but it does occur. I think most boys are frightened of the consequences of getting on the wrong side of Mr Slade because if he decides that you've done something wrong to him, he has that power to ruin your education, just like that. And the thing is that, I mean, the reason my voice is disguised at the moment it's because I've got another couple of years to go there and it's just not a risk that most boys are prepared to take. And in case that all sounds like a schoolboy's tall story, I must tell you what he says is supported by other pupils and by at least nine former members of staff. Let's take the issue of corporal punishment first. The headmaster is publicly in favour of it and publicly holds in contempt the European Court of Human Rights, which is not in favour of it. I believe in corporal punishment. It's not excessive, 
It's not immensely frequent, as I know has been suggested. But yes, I believe in corporal punishment. I think it has a place in this school. I don't necessarily say it has a place in all schools. But even supporters of corporal punishment, including, it must be said, the parents of some of his pupils, might feel differently if they knew how far Mr Slade actually went. Former assistant matron Pamela Green recalls how the crunch came for her. A crowd of boys came running up to me and said, um, have you seen so-and-so's bottom, miss? And I said, no, because I, um, I wasn't in the habit of looking at every boy's bottoms. But I decided that perhaps I ought to have a look. And when I did, I was quite horrified with what I'd seen. The boy in question was about eight or nine, and the whole of his backside was covered in bruises of every colour that you could possibly think of. A few days later, another lad walked into the dormitory while I was on duty with two black eyes and a very red face. When I asked him how he'd acquired them, he said one he'd got from playing rugby and the other from the headmaster. I didn't know what to do. The following day, I had a visit from a friend and I told her how worried I was about uh, what I'd seen at the school. After I told her, she reminded me that she was a social worker and uh, would have to put in report to her superiors, which she did. A few hours later, I had a phone call from the bursar of the school who said uh, that my services were no longer required at the school. I was sacked. And threatened with legal action if she made further public complaint. Mind you, Mr Slade himself once left a teaching job prematurely after exhibiting a predilection for extreme discipline. <laughs> Mark Anderson took offence at some of the other institutionalised violence at St George's. What really got me was some of the official fights that took place on an extreme regular basis. These fist fights, because that's what they were, took place with the headmaster as the referee and the two participants were surrounded by their peers yelling them on to do damage to their opponent. Often the fights were stopped when blood was drawn, although there were no strict rules. They were interpreted by the headmaster as he went along. These official fights were extremely dangerous and extremely unfair. The headmaster not only seemed to enjoy them, but certainly encouraged them. Which, in the opinion of Mr Anderson and a number of others, in turn encouraged the boys to punch first and ask questions afterwards. Then there were the so-called reigns of terror, which particularly affected the juniors, the pre-11-year-olds, as taught by Jenny Marlow. I had one little boy in my class who was terribly upset about these reigns of terror that we'd been having. The reign of terror is a punishment to the entire school whereby all their privileges are taken away. They are on total silence, absolutely everywhere. They had to go to bed straight after prep, and that means even the sort of 16, 17-year-old boys were going to bed extremely early. They couldn't leave the school premises for any reason whatsoever. They were not allowed to use the telephone. They were not allowed to watch the television. And it was just an extremely unpleasant situation for children and teachers alike. It, the, the whole school was tense for days on end. It, it, at one point, it went on for nearly a week. Anyway, this little boy wrote home and complained to his parents about this reign of terror, and his parents wrote to the school, to the headmaster, to say what's going on. And as soon as the headmaster received the letter, in the very next assembly, he publicly took the boy out of assembly, took him in front of the whole school and expelled him for complaining. It doesn't do to complain, so few people do. Improvements, where there are any, are therefore very slow. The food in the school was not particularly nutritious, particularly in the first year that I was teaching there. And for the juniors, which is the age group I taught, I didn't feel that it was adequate. They weren't getting enough vitamins. And they were very, very tired. They had colds, cold sores generally under the weather quite a lot of the time and I think a lot of this is to do with the sort of food that they were eating. It was also to do with the fact that they had to work very very long hours including the six and seven year olds sometimes they had to work from nine until six at night. When they actually went to bed in the summer months it was difficult for them to go to sleep because there was no curtains in their dormitories 
They slept, some of them were fifty in a dormitory, with the older boys walking in and out of the dormitories until their bedtimes. And often the little ones didn't get to sleep till eleven, sometimes twelve o'clock at night, with the result that some of them fell asleep in lessons. Nigel Kenton Barnes used to do that too as a junior. He actually stayed the course through the school, but as he points out, you can get used to almost anything. After you'd been there about a year and a half, I was a prefect after then, so it wasn't too bad for me, but I can imagine what it was like for the little people who had just come. It's like, well, he didn't really make it like a home to him. If he used to make a reign of terror, you couldn't do anything. You couldn't go out and phone calls. You weren't allowed to book out. The tuck shop where you buy sweets was shut. You didn't get any pocket money for a week. And one time we got a rain and tell. We had to work, do prep, that's homework, till dorm time. Sometimes you felt like you couldn't do anything. You sort of like in your dorm, you had to stay in there, you couldn't do anything. But I don't know if it's like a prison camp, but not far off it. <laughs> well, if you'd done something wrong, obviously you'd get punished for it. Sometimes I deserve to be whacked for things I've done wrong, but most times you get whacked, you don't really deserve it, really. I remember one time I got six of the cane. I had to walk into the study when there's loads of different sized canes on the table and he said, you shouldn't have done this, shouldn't have done that and then go over in the corner, take your trousers down. Then he'd come over with a cane and sort of hit you six times. And then he'd sort of afterwards, you put your trousers up, you walk over there again, he'd talk to you, and then he'll write it down in Greek. Mr. Slade apparently keeps a full record of his pupils' every move during punishment sessions, as Nigel says, in Greek. He also has a favourite essay, a descriptive piece which is often set as a punishment. Here's an excerpt from a relatively mild example. Whackings I have had. I was outside the study because I had written on the desk. I was scared. The headmaster told me to come in. I touched my toes. He went to the cupboard and got out a funny-looking bat. He raised it, and the bat came down at the speed of sound. The first whack felt like a volcano erupting. Then it felt like stinging bees. Then it felt like a red-hot poker with steam coming off it as it came down with great force on my bottom. This was agony. I nearly screamed out in pain. The pressure of the whack shoved me forward. There were five more whacks to come. Amazingly, Slade never considered his behaviour might be regarded as completely unacceptable and shocking. Is it true that you have ordered boys to write essays entitled Whackings I've Had? We have used that as an essay title. Um, I'm astonished that uh, that seems to be a cause for concern. It's, it just never had occurred to me that it could be.